Thanks, Annie. Thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, this is, I don't know if we need to set this up. Yeah. Go ahead, you're good. Okay. Um, so the low line, uh, how many of you are familiar with what the low line is as an idea? Okay, a nice number of you. Uh, so you're, you're familiar with the idea that the low line is a plan to convert uh, an abandoned trolley station, actually just a few blocks from where we are right now, into what we're calling the world's first underground park using a new uh, innovative solar technology. Um, I think what we wanted to do tonight was to really share a little bit about what that space actually is and go a little bit deeper, um, literally, in understanding what uh, kind of space this really is. So it really all started actually with the discovery of this site. These are some old photos that we found online. They're grainy, they're not really all that elegant, but you can kind of get a sense of what it is. Uh, this is actually something that, so James Ramsey, my, my partner, is all the way in the back there hiding, um, actually discovered this with the help of some old uh, MTA transit folks uh, and said, look, this is one of these old gems underneath the streets of the city that uh, have really just been forgotten and unused for, for many years. And wouldn't it be cool if we came up with something interesting to do with the space? So we begged uh, the MTA to bring us down into the site. And long story short, we got down there. And this is a really simple photo that we took with like our iPhone or something uh, that shows the sheer scale of the space, right? So when you're down there, it just feels like you're Indiana Jones on some kind of a secret expedition. Uh, it really is a, a marvelous feeling when you're down there. It, 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 it does feel very adventurous and, and, uh, and really a lot of fun. And we, we thought about this space as something that we, we would really want to save, but, uh, but also turn into something even more interesting. Uh, some of the other things that we found down there were uh, examples of people having fun, uh, uh, some, some graffiti, some tagging. Uh, we found an old control tower where you can see, uh, it almost feels like, you know, sort of filled with ghosts. Actually, the, the, the uh, uh, New York City Transit Museum actually does a, a periodic tour of the site called Trolley Ghosts, actually, and it does sort of feel that way. It feels like this forgotten space that might be inhabited by ghosts. And you can see a lot of the old architectural details are all still there. These old um, Belgian blocks and rail lines are all, all there. So we sensed that this was something that was going to be of interest, but we didn't really know the, the historic value. And uh, our friends actually at the J.M. Kaplan Fund, uh, including Ken Lusbader, actually really was helpful in, in really uh, letting us know that there, there was a lot of work for us to do to understand from a historical standpoint what was the value of the space. And he suggested that we talk to some of the smartest people in, in town who think about this stuff, the folks at Higgins Quaysbarth. And so we asked them to conduct a historic uh, uh, preservation study for us to really uh, dig deep into what the, the, the space was, to learn about the history surrounding the site, uh, and uh, to, to, to really make an assessment for, is this a space that should be preserved from a historic standpoint? What, what, what is the value to us uh, as a city in saving this space and, and, and really what, what's down there? Uh, so that was really what we, uh, we tasked Take and Squeeze Barth to do, and they did a really tremendous job with, with that task. So uh, I wanted to turn it over primarily to them to sort of really share what they found, and, uh, and then we can kind of give you an update after they're done with all of that on, on really where we are with the Low Line project and what our next few steps will be. So. Good evening. What a great turnout. This is just so terrific. Um, Dan has uh, great enthusiasm for this space that um, is known as the low line, and he's inspired by its potential, and that um, excitement is really pretty uh, uh, contagious. Um, uh, there's a more ponderous name uh, historically for it, which is the Williamsburg Bridge Underground uh, trolley tunnel. Um, so low line is much more uh, euphonious, I think. Um, at the beginning of the year, uh, uh, Dan and Ken, Ken Lestbader um, approached Higgins Quays Barth to assist in preparing consolidating uh, a history of the underground terminal to put it into context with the story of the Williamsburg Bridge, local transportation, and the Lower East Side neighborhood. Um, and we thought it sounded like a really interesting thing to do. And I actually got to go into the space, which was, um, was a lot of fun. Um, Rachel 
Rachel Fergins um, undertook the research with the direction of our um, uh, HQ partner, uh, Aaron Ruley. Um, and we also had assistance from Richard Piper from Jan Hurd Picorni Associates um, in looking at the existing fabric and um, thinking about some of the technical issues. Rachel found drawings, articles, and a great trove of um, historical photographs. Some of them are really technical and gritty and sort of nerdy, and some of them are construction uh, pictures that also catch a little piece of um, what was happening um, on the street at the same time. Um, we have a list of those photos, um, and they're in uh, paper form uh, photocopies. It would be really great at some point if we could get good copies and they could be accessible to people because it's really um, pretty interesting stuff. Um, the research that Rachel did was very specific regarding the construction history and function of the terminal, but it also touched on immigration history, which I think a lot of you who are involved with the Tenement uh, Museum know much better than, than we do. Um, it also touched on the release of the overcrowded population of the Lower East Side into Brooklyn um, and the impact of technology on transportation. Um, as with most research projects, the more research you do, the more you um, know what you don't know. And um, we're hoping that you all will uh, offer some insights and uh, have some ideas on things that we um, haven't uh, learned about yet. Um, so we, we hope that you'll share those thoughts. Rachel's work, we think, gives historical ballast to Dan's vision for the low line, and it's a really interesting story with um, some good images. So, Rachel. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to the Tenement Museum for having us this evening. Um, as Elise said, this was a pretty focused study in the history of what this trolley terminal was before it was be became the trolley terminal, and then what it did for the Lower East Side and for this neighborhood. Um, and I'm sure many of you do know a lot more about particularly the technical aspects of the trains and where they went and how they functioned. But what we're really trying to do here is combine all of that technicality with the cultural and social history at the time. So I'll begin with um, an overview of what was here. We're jumping ahead in a little bit of the history, but this is a photo from 1919 taken on Delancey Street, I believe Delancey in Essex. And you can see um, off in the background here, this is the, we're looking east across the East River, and this is the Williamsburg Bridge. And this was constructed in 1903, but did not have the capacity to run a, trains across for several years later. But what we're looking at here are, on the south side here, automobiles would come up, and is that pretty clear for everyone to see? I can. <laughs> this angle. Um, automobiles coming up in the south road here. There's a pedestrian walkway here, which as you got farther out into the bridge, would have gone over trolley tracks for trains that were coming in from um, Brooklyn. And then on the other side, opposite a pedestrian way as well, and then beneath those, the Manhattan streetcars would run in and out of Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, below that was um, the roadway on the uh, left, or excuse me, the north side, and then in the middle of all of that was um, where the elevated rails were built for the subway to eventually come across the bridge. And on the right-hand side here is where pedestrians would have entered the bridge. On the left-hand side here, Manhattan streetcars would have come out and either turned down Clinton Street to continue on their routes, or maybe even come up and circle this kiosk with the head house here. Um, to pick up passengers waiting here, either then to go back across the bridge or farther into Manhattan. And on the south side of the street here is the uh, kiosk that marked the above ground entry to the Williamsburg Bridge underground trolley terminal, the um, piece of information that we're here to hear the most about, the item. Um, and then passengers would enter, there are eight loops that this terminal service, and passengers would enter here. And I've got some plans later that we'll see that will give a little bit more context. Um, but I just really wanted to set where we are, what we're looking at, and what we'll be talking about. So Dan showed you a picture of what this looks like underground, both historically and presently. And then we'll jump into a little bit more of the history. Um, but you also notice here, just for uh, curiosity's sake, there are just pretty much automobiles everywhere. And I don't believe at this time there were any traffic lights or very significant traffic signs that would have helped direct people in any, in any manner. And this is the same view taken from Google Maps today. You can see that um, there's this one building here at Clinton Street, which remains, so flip back and you can see it 
off in the distance here. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's right here. So that's pretty much the only thing that offers us any sense of organization of where we are right now. And the trolley terminal headhouses are gone, the kiosks are gone, the buildings have been completely torn away on this side, and it really looks ripe for some, some sort of change. And this is the condition underground today. Dan showed you a picture briefly already. But of um, significance is on this side, you can see the, the JMZ tracks of the train. Some of you probably rode that uh, subway, the subway lines here tonight. And it's immediately adjacent to this trolley space. So you may have looked across the tracks sometimes and have seen this cavernous space, sometimes lit, sometimes not. This is precisely the area that we're talking about tonight. And a little bit more context. Here's a 1911 Bromley map. Circled here on the south side of Delancey Street is that kiosk and head house that we're talking about. And on the north side is where the Manhattan cars turned around and also the subway entrances. And there were sub several other subway entrances along Delancey Street that just don't show up in this map here. And you'll also notice along Delancey Street that the buildings are pretty much level with one another until they pop out here at Norfolk and Essex. And this Delancey Street was widened several times when the, the bridge approach was built and then again when the trolley terminals were constructed. And this left a pretty jagged condition on Delancey Street, one that didn't, um, the city didn't really know what to do with it and it was very much a, well we've got to widen the street, we'll just lob off these buildings here. And I read in several places speculation that it kind of created a rough condition for um, for the rest of the time that Delancey Street was as wide as it was with the trolley cars. And they weren't able to do much with this space. So that's kind of where we are geographically and in terms of transportation. And here is where we are socially and culturally. As you learned in the early, in the 1900s, this was one of the most crowded quarters in the earth. And it, people and things were just spilling out everywhere. And you can see here all the goods that are for sale on the street. And these gentlemen over here are completing the construction of one of the subway entrances. And this was taken in 1908 on the north side of Delancey Street, looking west. And you can um, see all of the, the signage and all of the goods for sale. And it's all really colliding in this very small space. And also during this time, there's rapid development in terms of what sort of transportation the city wants to build as they go into a new century and as all of the boroughs are becoming united in 1898 to form unified New York City. There was really no planning commission that could oversee what exactly, the, where the city should go. The Municipal Art Society was created in the early 1900s and served somewhat a role in terms of design and trying to think through what exactly should happen because the most significant piece was getting people from these incredibly crowded areas to other areas in Brooklyn and Manhattan and, and north and beyond. So here's the Brooklyn Bridge was, which was constructed in 1883 and was considered sorely needed. Um, but did by no means, it was by no means able to handle all of the people that it needed to transport. And the city really also wasn't able to think comprehensively, of course at this time it wasn't a unified city when the Brooklyn Bridge was completed. They weren't able to consider, so we've got this bridge and people can go across, but where do they go once they're on the other side? They, they, they did not conceive of these aspects of circulation of where, where you'd go. But I like this photo a lot because we're on the Brooklyn side looking across the East River and there are these elevated trains that are coming across here and then you've got the Brooklyn trolley cars and this is a good place to illustrate the difference between the Brooklyn trolley cars and the Manhattan street cars. The Manhattan street cars would pull their power from a third rail. Um, it was in between the the tracks that guided on, them on the street and Brooklyn cars had to pull their power from a trolley cable which was hung overhead and in Manhattan, the overhead wires were prohibited, so it really didn't offer for an easy marrying of Brooklyn cars in, in Manhattan. And also on the uh, north side of the bridge, you can see um, horse and cart transportation, which was still popular at this time as well. So in this um, context of incredibly overcrowded and inefficient modes of transportation, came about the idea for a third, or excuse me, a second East River Bridge. Um, it was conceived in the early 1890s, but um, for various reasons was not actually realized until the mid-1890s. Um, and this is a sketch from 1898 of the construction of the new East River Bridge, which would later be known as the Williamsburg Bridge. And also was 
constructed without any concept of how to get people across other than by their own feet or by a horse's hooves. And um, also, one of the other reasons, actually, that um, the city was a little dodgy to construct another bridge was the, the ferry lobby, if you will, was um, quite strong and had a lot of influence and said, well, if you construct these bridges, we know that our, our industry is pretty much shot. And they were pretty much right, because around 1908, a lot of these ferries ceased to cross the East River, which was, this was one of the most popular modes of transportation up until this point. So the Williamsburg Bridge is completed in 1903 and again does not really have any sort of circulation capacity for how to get people from one point to another. Um, and the city also doesn't really know how to work with these private train and streetcar operators to get these cars across the bridge. Because while well, the city built the bridge and built the tracks, they felt they had no obligation for considering transportation. They said, we maintain the bridges, we maintain the tracks, and will lease the, the pleasure, the privilege of driving cars on these tracks to private operators. So finally, the bridge was completed in 1903, and um, Manhattan, or excuse me, Brooklyn trolley cars weren't run over the bridge until 1904, because the city didn't know how to bring them in. Finally, this temporary terminal was constructed, and the, the Brooklyn trolley cars would come in on this side here. You can see the, um, the scaffolding overhead, which would have met the trolley cables to provide power. And this only offered two tracks, and it was very much a stub. Trolley cars would drive in, drop people off, and then turn around and drive right back out. It was, there was no, nowhere for it to go. You can see here it, it pretty much functioned as a dead end. Um, but through the organization of the bridge, um, bridge operating company, which was an organization of, I think, five different private streetcar operators and trolley car operators, they were able to offer this, this as an agreement. So in this context of the Williamsburg, is, the Williamsburg Bridge is built and people are able to sort of get around by these modes of transportation, um, there's also this cultural aspect where people are adopt, adapting the bridge to their own use. And it became so much so that this bridge was actually once referred to as the, the Jews Highway because so many people were going back and forth from Williamsburg into the Lower East Side. And they may have moved to Williamsburg, but they maintained very strong social and cultural ties on the Lower East Side, um, attending religious services, visiting social organizations, family and friends. And I think this image captures that idea really well of some um, people praying on the bridge on the Jewish New Year. And um, we were speculating that perhaps they were even throwing bread into the, um, yes, exactly, um, to atone for sins. So in this context, we've got this overcrowded population. We've got people who are starting to be able to go into Williamsburg and Manhattan. They're moving around a lot more, but the stub terminal is completely inefficient. So after debating about whether or not it would be appropriate to construct an elevated system that would run off of the bridge and through Delancey Street and over to Center Street, this loop idea, this circulation of, of, transporta of transportation and of um, commuters, the city decides, no, we don't want this elevated railway, even though the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Organization was saying, we don't really do subways, we just do these elevated train cars, we'd really like to keep this above ground so we can continue our business. The city said, well, we're, gonna, we're actually going to build this trolley terminal because we need to offer so much more of a capacity for our people so once they come into the station, they can load and unload and then go back out and then go farther out into Brooklyn sort of these modes of, of connectivity. And so the trolley terminal was opened in 1908. And here's a plan showing the eight loops. And each loop had a stair entrance and a stair exit. And the, the trolley cars would come in off the bridge on the southern tracks and pull in, drop passengers off, and then pull over into this side to pick passengers up and then go back onto the bridge. And here's the sectional cut um, north-south of the, the station. You can see the um, platforms on the other side with the trolley, or excuse me, with the uh, train tracks are these two tracks on the north side, which are where uh, the JMZ runs today. So when we were talking earlier about you look across the tracks and into that, that vacant space, this is, you're over here and the space was over here. The JMZ train, the, sure, sorry. 
And this is what these looked like above ground. So we've got these really functional tracks below ground that were quite adorned and um, pretty well decorated above ground. And you can see here where those exit and entrance loops are and then the name of each of the trolley uh, lines above. And then a, this is a pulled back view looking down uh, Delancey Street West towards the Bowery. And on the left hand side is the, um, the entrance to the underground trolley terminal. And these are just beautiful little Beaux-Arts um, head houses that were adorned in terracotta. They were constructed by Henry Hornbostel and his partner Palmer and were kind of considered a last gasp at trying to make the things associated with the Williamsburg Bridge uh, beautiful because the bridge was designed in a very functional manner um, and was never considered aesthetically very beautiful as the Brooklyn Bridge was. Um, he was, Henry Hornbostel was hired um, as the, the consulting architect for the bridges department but past the point where he could have done really any, any good to the Williamsburg Bridge. I just love this, of the woman bustling in the foreground. And <laughs> so it's in this context of, um, we've got the, term, the trolley terminal that's been constructed. And we ha now also in 1908 had an elevated car that was running from East Brooklyn over the Williamsburg Bridge, the center tracks that we talked about before, and down into the, the trolley terminal um, to the tracks to the north. But that was just functioning as kind of a terminal, as a dead end space for this. But the, the trolley cars are really, really working quite well. And along Delancey Street, this is looking west towards Bowery. This was all also excavated for subway lines in this manner of circulation and getting people from point A to point B. And as an agreement with BRT, uh, the city said with the Brooklyn Rapid Transit um, Company, rather than building your elevated, we'll put this underground and kind of as a, an appeasement to the community, they also said, we'll give you this, this park. And I know in this black and white photo, it, it doesn't look particularly green, nor does it look like there are really any trees there, but you really have to consider that this is pretty significant for the neighborhood and that there was somewhere you could stand and see the sunlight and not be um, surrounded by 10-story tenement buildings. Uh, there's also this really fantastic quote um, about the a newspaper writing about the, the opening of Delancey Street and saying um, that perpetual light and air, or that citizens were rejoicing for perpetual light and air with no sacrifice of their health and property to the demands of the rest of the city for transit accommodations. So almost spiteful that the city would want to take away their land for these, um, for these loops, but really it's, it's for the good of the city. And it's also at this time that um, the dual system is established, which brought together the, the interborough rapid transit trains and the Brooklyn rapid transit trains, and they were able to operate all subway cars in Manhattan. So as the, the, century, the 20th century rolls on, it's, it's really much a time of, of subways and rapidly becoming so. Here's an image from 1923, which I think just fantastically shows how chaotic this is. And um, in a lot of the images we were looking at before, it's hard to get the sense of just how many people were down here. Uh, oftentimes, I think that the photos that we found were during construction, so people weren't necessarily allowed to walk around. Um, but this is very much an action photo of what's going on. Uh, and I think we're right at Clinton Street at the end of the, the bridge looking west. Um, of course, the, the Manhattan streetcar and subway entrance um, headhouse is here, and then the, the underground trolley entrance here. There's just this, this mad rush of, of cars and streetcars, um, and kind of going every which way just to try to get on onto the bridge. And it was at this time in 1919 when the the trolley terminal reached its um, peak operating capacity or, or received its largest numbers, I guess, of people passing in and out. Um, right around this time as well, the Williamsburg Bridge was starting to fail structurally because when it was constructed, they couldn't imagine how much weight exactly would be would be going across the bridge. I mean, it was built with the idea that there would be subway cars and there would be um, automobiles, but they also thought about it in terms of horses and horse-drawn carts. And so it was really built kind of straddling these two centuries, um, and really, I think, exemplifies that really well in, in, throughout its, its history. And so also after um, the subways were connected with the, the Center Street Loop, um, subway cars are just running through at a rapid pace, and um, 
things are starting to look a little dire for the, the trolleys. In 1920, the bridge operating company, which had won the contract to operate the, all the cars across, all the, the trolley cars and streetcars across the, um, the bridge expired, and the city took over the operation of those cars, leased it to a new company, and actually only had one trolley car line running across the bridge, which is the bridge local. Um, and it's also about at this time that in 1924 a very restrictive immigration act was passed, pretty much putting quotas on the number of immigrants that were able to come in from different countries. So all of a sudden it's almost as if somebody pushed the pause button because nobody else was coming into this community but still people were leaving at a very rapid rate because they were able to, to access different areas. And, well, it's probably a stretch to say that the, the bridges were completely functional um, or, I guess, successful at bringing people efficiently around. Um, by this time, we also had the Queensboro Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge, both of which were also constructed by or designed by Henry Hornbostel, whom we um, mentioned earlier. But it's in this context that the Lower East Side is starting to have a vacancy rate of 22.4%. And the city looked at it and thought, well, this is kind of shutting down in some ways, and so we will also <laughs> respond accordingly. And the, the trolley cars were not given any more funding by the city to help improve the, the fleet or even to increase um, fares. And it was also around this time that um, Mayor LaGuardia took federal housing funds and rather than building up the tenements or improving them, just knocked them down and started to build large public housing towers. So the, the, and also in 1940, the Essex Street Market was constructed. So rather than having all these goods and people and um, street carts on the street, which we saw in that 1908 photo of the little boy watching the, the subway entrance constructed, all these things are being taken inside and, and organized in a way that makes the neighborhood, I'm sure, feel quite different. So in, in this, where the neighborhood is being redefined, the, the trolley terminal is also reflecting this reality above ground. And in 1948, the last um, trolley car runs out of the, the underground terminal because uh, the city decided that they wanted to put funds in automobiles and in bus routes because that was the future and that's where these things were going. Um, although the, the trolley cars were still used pretty significant, in significant numbers, um, but they just they weren't up to the, the job anymore. They weren't in good condition and um, the companies just weren't able to, to provide for the community as they once had. So the um, trolley terminal is closed, and the street kiosks and the head houses that we saw before were gradually demolished to allow for Delancey Street to widen, allow more automobiles to come up and down the street. And um, I really like this image. I think this is taken from one of the, um, the way stations on the Williamsburg Bridge. If you're walking as a pedestrian, it kind of juts out there with, um, I believe, Brooklyn's at our back, and we're looking into Manhattan. This is on the south side where the trolley tracks once were. They were ripped out, and the B39 bus route was, um, was installed. And it's also in 1940 that the, um, just to add this as well to consider exactly this context, the um, dual subway system was established. So the BMT, the Brooklyn Manhattan um, Transit Corporation, and the Interboro Rapid Transit Corporation were um, unified with the newly um, city-owned, city-run independent station, and they were all rolled into one. So city's starting to kind of get it together and consolidate things um, in a much more planned and efficient way. And then this image from 1975, looking about where we were before, and there's that building again at Clint, uh, Clinton Street, to kind of orient you. But you can see that this, the context here has completely changed. It's just this big, wild, open road, kind of a, looks like it could be a free-for-all in terms of traffic. And I think that this is what um, Dan and his partner really look at and see above ground what's happening and all the, the potential that there is for development and what that means for the, um, the underground terminal space as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. And uh, I might ask James if you want to if you want to head toward the front here, so we can kind of bring us into the into the present a little bit. Um, I think uh, th this is actually a, a one small shred of all of the great research that you guys did, and um, I think that sort of. Baking this and putting this into a presentation, it's been really. I actually even like learned some new things just hearing you right now. So thanks for um, for all of that. I think one of the the conclusions that we also drew. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, horn bossel. Um, uh, what, uh, one of the one of the lessons that I that I also took from from this uh, this study was the sense that this is, to our understanding, the largest surviving relic of this transit history of of of, of specifically of, of of the trolley car history in this particular part of the city. Um, and just looking at the historic value of uh, this particular neighborhood to the city overall and the historical development, that it is something that is historically fascinating and interesting and something that we should think about how we can preserve um, some of the elements that were that were placed there you know over a hundred years ago at this point uh, so you know as Rachel alluded to you know in as we as we think about the present and we look at what Delancey Street really represents today it's interesting there's really a lot of the same types of challenges that even uh, uh, were faced at the beginning of the 20th century around density and in this case it's actually really about automobile traffic and um, those of you who live in the neighborhood or follow politics in the neighborhood know that it's an incredibly uh, unsafe set of intersections on Delancey Street, both for cars and for bikes and for pedestrians. And part of the mayor's uh, Vision Zero policy really centers ar around and is focused on safety initiatives around Delancey Street. Uh, so uh, you may be aware also if you, uh, uh, this is an interesting, yeah. So you can see the, the green overlay there is uh, the, the footprint of the, the actual low-line site itself. And the pink overlays are uh, the site of the new uh, construction that will be built as part of what's known as Essex Crossing, or uh, some of you might know these sites as the Seward Park Urban Renewal Area, or SPURA. Um, and so this is one and a half million square feet of redevelopment. Uh, on eight different parcels and uh, will dramatically transform the neighborhood in really significant ways, as well as dramatically transforming Delancey Street itself with the addition of all of these new people and new businesses. So what the low line really can represent is a, another way to think about how we can potentially weave together the community, stitch together a little bit of what was maybe lost over the course of the 20th century. This is a really low resolution <laughs> view of the, um, the new redevelopment, so you can kind of see uh, you know, there it, it looks very sort of modern. It's this, all, all of these new towers that will be literally just a few blocks from where we are right now over the course of the next 10 years. And uh, the plaza immediately in front of it, where you can see a little bit of green, would hopefully be the ceiling and uh, and the top of and and essentially how you would get into the actual low line site itself. Um, so this is the technology that uh, uh, basically James and his team have have devised, which is really, in a nutshell, involves how you can actually reflect enough sunlight underground to illuminate this otherwise very dark space, making it um, much more uh, beautiful and the kind of place that actual humans would want to spend time. But even more exciting and more interesting is the idea that we could support photosynthesis. So you could have plants and trees down in the space and approach something that we call a park, in quotation marks, uh, underground. Uh, and uh, really using this as a way to dramatically transform, saving some of the history of the site and also bringing it very much into the future. So with this technology, uh, James and his team have designed some, um, some renderings of how the space could look. And these are some of the drawings, some of you may have seen these already, uh, but these are some, some images that show uh, how the space could look with the introduction of natural sunlight underground using this technology uh, and the introduction of plants and trees. You can see there next to um, the lady in, in short shorts, uh, a, um, a series, yeah, thanks James, the, um, uh, some, some sort of models of how we might uh, use some of the existing cobblestones, rail lines, the actual infrastructure that's currently there, and interspersing that with all these other green elements and very modern um, community-centered uh, uh, design features. Here's another view of that. So James, I don't know if you wanted to walk through a little bit of our, our technology research at this point, um, or I can. <laughs> Do you want to? You want? Um, yeah. Just give me a heads up, what other slides are in here? <laughs> yeah, so we have this, and then it, it goes through like the Delancey Street. OK, all right. Um, I guess just by way of context, though, um, the low line is certainly kind of a startling idea, right? Like using the science fiction-y technology, snaking sunlight underground and growing stuff in a lost space, right? <laughs> Um, but, you know, we always try to, um, I don't know, refine our understanding of history to inform, you know, what is to come. And um, I think it's important to point out that one of the central ideas that sort of governed the design and the creation of the low-line idea in general 
was that maybe we could compel people by using design and technology as a tool to actually um, unlock this long forgotten space and maybe expose people to, um, I don't know, a little facet of this incredibly wonderful complex city um, and sort of force people to actually interact with it and, uh, and, and realize just how rich um, sort of our shared cultural heritage is. And so, you know, in the case of, in the case of designing the low line, um, you know, I, I don't know if you could tell from the images, but it's very important to us that we introduce this sort of modern technology and sort of, I don't know, bio design kind of stuff in a way that almost snakes through the space and in, sort of exists in tension with the older stuff that's actually there and works very hard to not only preserve it, but in drawing the contrast with it, um, sort of underscore how beautiful and important that, that stuff actually is. And so, you know, that's one thing. I guess the second thing I would say is just as, you know, just down the street in the, in the Low Line's previous incarnation as a trolley turnaround, the turnaround had to have um, an intersection with the street level. And you saw some of those images uh, earlier. And I think one of the important things to point out about them is the amount of street life and vibrancy in some of those older images when they still had those head houses poking through the street as opposed to that image you saw in the 70s when it was just a giant tarmac, looked like a runway or something, right? Or as opposed to actually uh, present day, obviously the DOT plaza over there is certainly helping, but um, the idea of the low line uh, being used intrinsically also then involves uh, us also inter uh, sort of interacting with the street level. And our hope is that we can actually use these things like the entrance into the space the means by which we're sort of mining the sunlight and getting it down there as a way to, you know, not only introduce a human scale to Delancey Street again, but in a lot of ways to almost, I don't know, uh, restore the original historical condition that really was such a large part of why that little pocket over there was so vibrant once upon a time. And um, hopefully that's something that we can successfully tap into through a greater understanding of um, you know, your work and the, the sort of the history of the site in order to create something that really is successful and full of life. And so to, to that end, you know, we began map, and again, I don't really know what slides we're about to see, but we began to map out sort of the areas of the street which are going to be completely unused and map those out against the shadows that the future developers are going to create with these buildings, right? And actually use those in tandem to generate almost, well, to generate mathematically exactly how we're going to uh, gather all this sunlight, how to deal with it, et cetera. And the interesting thing is once you take that research and combine it with research that we have about where we actually need to provide entry from code reasons to egress uh, reasons, et cetera, or just simply from the intersection with the public plazas above, um, the beginnings, and I want to just be totally cautious about all this stuff, the beginnings of um, an idea about what those intersections between the low line and the streetscape might actually be begin to uh, emerge. And so you, you start to have a sense that there could be this public plaza above ground on Delancey Street, almost restoring life to Delancey Street, providing this sort of um, uh, set of marquee entries, also using these sort of um, solar devices to actually uh, make it a more human kind of space and deploy all of this stuff in a way that actually sort of creates a successful urban experience. And, you know, this is a horribly dark image here, but uh, um, I kind of want to end on it just because it illustrates, you know, the first point I made where um, just, you know, the suggestion that there is a little bit more to the city than you care to notice or, you know, stop on a day to day basis to think about, I think is such a powerful one, especially with a city like New York. And so the idea that maybe, just maybe, if we peeled up the sidewalk and got a glimpse into the very sort of layer cake and the strata of New York City, I think you could create kind of an amazing, rich experience which would compel New Yorkers to sort of think a little bit more about their city. All right. Hey, I'm uh, Zach Ahrens. As Annie kindly mentioned, I'm uh, on the board of both the Low Line and the Tenement Museum. I'm just thrilled to be here, seeing the marriage of those two organizations. And uh, just wanted to point out that uh, we're going to be selling naming rights to this area. So if anyone brought their checkbook this evening and wants to 
name one of the steps down into the low line, please, uh, please see me. Or the Tenement Museum. Or if you want to give money to the Tenement Museum, you can get your name right there in a place that actually physically exists currently. Um, so I just, I, I just wanted to say a couple things and then, and then ask a couple of questions to kind of break the ice. And then we want to open it up to, uh, to Q&A for everybody who wants to ask. Um, one point I want to make, which uh, is, is one of the great ironies of New York, is uh, Delancey Street's named after a gentleman named James Delancey and his family. And they were loyalists uh, who were thrown out of our great city and booted back to, the, to England in 1783 when uh, we finally evacuated the British. Um, and he and his farm, was, they were seized by the city. And um, I just think James Delancey would be turning over in his grave right now because Delancey Street has become, in many ways, the, the most quintessentially American street uh, in, the, in the entire country. Uh, it's a street where you see this building, 103 Orchard Street, which is a celebration of our past and the, 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 immigra the immigrant strength that built up this great city, and also with the Essex Crossing development and uh, the low line, it's a celebration of entrepreneurship, batshit crazy ideas, um, and everything else that that makes America so amazing, and, and especially makes New York City so amazing. Um, so I hope Mr. Delancey would be okay with, with what he left in his legacy. Um, and then, you know, so, so I just wanted to ask, uh, just get it kicked off, a couple questions. Um, you know, the, given that we're here at the Tenement Museum and the Tenement Museum celebrates immigration in the past and looks to the cultural fabric of the Lower East Side and, and the Lower East Side as a, as a microcosm for the entire world as a melting pot going forward. Um, stylistically, you've already shown how you're going to pay homage to the past uh, through the low line. But can you give us some idea of programming wise what you're going to do to celebrate the, the great immigrant past of the Lower East Side and also the, the future going forward, given that we're now, uh, the Williamsburg Bridge was built to evacuate people from the Lower East Side because it was so crowded. And now we're actually trying to bring people back, uh, both housing and businesses, et cetera. So, so how are you going to balance those things through, through some of the programming you guys uh, are planning once, once this fabulous project's actually up and running? Uh, that's a great question, Zach. Thanks for asking. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, so, you know, I think uh, that a big part of what we've done at the low line is really uh, connecting to and spending, you could, you could spend a lifetime really getting to know the Lower East Side and, and really learning about uh, all of the different community organizations and uh, educators and uh, leaders that make the neighborhood so interesting and so diverse. Um, we've partnered now with, um, you know, um, between s uh, over six leading community organizations with a wide variety of community programming. And a lot of the way that we think about what the Lowline could become is really an extension of how the Lowline can actually help serve some of the community organizations that have been working with these um, many different kinds of groups over the course of literally the last hundred plus years. Um, so the first answer to your question is uh, that we would think about programming in a way that, um, that that extends some of the work that the neighborhood is already doing in providing uh, a clear connection between the, the, the past, present, and future. Um, thinking about um, uh, the space itself, there's um, a second way that we can actually serve the, the, uh, the history of, 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 the, of the space is that uh, the space we, we believe can actually be demised into multiple sections and one of the sections would be a space that could be a flexible event and gathering space. So this talk, for example, could very easily happen underground in, in, uh, in the lawn. In fact, we, we might even have slightly better lighting, so the, the images might be a little, slight, slightly better resolution. Um, so I think we're, we're really thinking about this as a space where we would have the opportunity to, um, to, to draw in and, and have some historical programming. Um, and then there's actually just an actual design dimension of this too, which James and his team have really been playing with, is 
you know, how do we actually, from an architectural standpoint, as you noted, use the, 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 um, the Belgian blocks that we sometimes call cobblestones, uh, the rail lines, the catenary tracks, the old columns, um, in a referential way that really helps draw attention to those architectural details for those who are interested and for those who um, that notice these details. Um, thinking about ways that we can really memorialize what the actual physical shell of the space itself is, um, is definitely going to be core to the way that I think the way that we're inspired about the design. Thank you. All right, well, that was my only question. Uh, so let's open it up. Oh, and he's coming back. Thank you very much. So we do, of course, want to open everything up for questions. And the way that we do things here, we view um, the questions that you ask um, just uh, are just as important as the, as the presentations. And to give them that weight, when you have a question, um, we'll call you up, but we ask you to actually come up and ask the question here so everyone can see you. And again, this is just in this kind of sharing of this uh, community and giving importance to the questions that you ask. Um, so at least have a little handle. Now no one wants to ask a question. Um, hi, I was wondering, um, what's your timeline for making this happen, A, and um, B, that's pretty cool technology to be able to grow trees underground. Are you guys thinking of using it elsewhere since um, we have an entire city of underground magic here? I'll take the first question, James, take the second one. Um, <clears throat> sorry, your first question I've already forgotten. Timeline. The timeline. Um, so uh, <clears throat> we're hoping that uh, we would actually be able to time the low-line construction itself with the redevelopment of the neighborhood that we were just talking about so that one of the one of the central concerns for the city is you know if if we're digging up the neighborhood and thinking about making everybody unhappy with a lot of construction cranes and all that we may as well do it once and do it right uh, so our hope is that we would uh, we would time our our construction and our development with with that uh, right now we are, are still actually uh, negotiating directly with the city of New York and with the, the state of New York on um, pressuring the MTA, who holds the master lease on the site, this is maybe more information than you want, uh, to uh, to transfer the site to a city or state agency. So then we can then convey the space and turn it into a public amenity, which the MTA will, will not do. Um, so we're hoping that can happen in the next year or so, and we're hoping that within the next five years we would be able to begin construction. So um, it's not it's not too far off, but it's definitely, we're, we're sort of three, four years into it, and at least another five or six years ahead of us. And so wait, the question was, um, the technology is pretty cool? The technology is cool. Are you, are you thinking of using it elsewhere as well since we have so much underground space? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, let me preface this by saying that um, uh, it's not easy. And um, the conditions really do need to be a kind of a perfect storm of conditions to, um, to actually execute it properly. That said, there's something like 13 acres of unused underground space underneath, I guess, Manhattan alone, right? This is, this, there's a honeycomb underneath us. Um, and, you know, not all spaces are suitable or desirable or whatever, but, you know, I think that if this could serve as some sort of inspiration for future projects that do something similar, that would be a pretty amazing thing. We don't, we have enough to chew on with this one project as is, so we're really only sort of considering this for the time being. Rebecca Mansky, an educator at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. So I have a bit of a challenging question for you, following up on that. So it sounds like a tough, it does sound like a difficult set of issues that you have to deal with. So with climate change and with Sandy and with the flooding of the Lower East Side, like how are you, how do you negotiate that? Well, um, I think actually there's something kind of awesome to point out here, which is that, uh, like, well, okay, the last time you were on the bridge and you started heading over to Brooklyn, right, you were over Manhattan for a while before you get over the water, right? Um, it actually turns out that this site, even though it's at the foot of the bridge, is actually quite some distance from the water and well outside of the 100-year flooding mark. So um, when Sandy came, uh, you know, two years ago, um, there was ab uh, absolutely no damage to the low-line space. There was no flooding. Is the uh, 
a technology for the lighting in place now? I mean, do you have demonstration projects where it's already worked? Yeah, so um, back in 2012, um, what was that, in September or October or something? Anyway, we actually <laughs> we built a sort of a full-scale, um, you know, 30-foot-wide prototype with the actual sort of operating sunlight technology actually installed in it, real plants, et cetera. And we hooked it up for about a month. And lo and behold, we plugged in the sun and it worked, which was great. Um, but you know, this is a technology or a series of technologies that we continue to refine. Um, just this summer, um, the president of our board and I actually took a little field trip to South Korea to see something very similar in real operation, and it definitely does work. Um, and actually, in this coming year, we plan on building, I guess, what we're calling the low-line lab, in which we take what we had done in 2012 at full scale, combine it with what we've learned in the last two years, and actually implement it and sort of create the next generation of the technology, which, with any luck, is exactly what we'll be doing right over here. This is Suzette Brooks from the J.M. Kaplan Fund and a big friend of the Tenement Museum. Um, and a great person. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious about uh, getting the approvals. Uh, and you said a year if you're lucky. And I know this has been an ongoing battle and it's not easy. So can you talk a little more about the challenges of negotiating an arrangement? Is there a plan B? Is there a drop dead date where if you don't get approval by a certain point, like the project is, is essentially dead because of all the other development that's happening? Just like what are your downside risks? Yeah. Wow, I don't know how much time you guys have, um, but that's, that, that's a whole other talk. Um, yeah, <laughs> but the, um, uh, let's see, the best way to, to answer that is, um, you know, we've been, the, the, the central basic uh, challenge for us, as I mentioned, is the city of New York owns the site, the MTA holds the master lease on the site, as it does with every other space adjacent to subways in the city. Um, the MTA has never had any use for it as, uh, as an entity um, and uh, ha has no stated real estate or commercial interest in the space um, and also no transit use for the space. So uh, what we've been able to, to engage the MTA on so far is uh, an understanding that since it does not have a transit or commercial value to them, uh, that they would be willing to sever their ties to the site and convey it to a city agency um, uh, for a different kind of life, for a different kind of administration. Uh, but they uh, have said to us that they need the city or, or, or the governor to officially request for that to, that, for that to happen. Um, a bit of bureaucratic sort of play at, at work there. Uh, and so uh, what we are doing right now is engaging directly with a very receptive uh, city administration. So Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn has actually recently said uh, really that she endorses the project and is on the record um, supporting us. Uh, right now I would, I would say that we are in a, a stage of, um, of discovery and exploration at the city at, at City Hall's bequest so that we can really answer all of, this, all of the many questions that they have. Um, I won't spend too much time talking about it, but there are questions related to fire safety and life preservation systems There's, uh, that relate to the fire department. There are concerns with the Department of Transportation, which are several dozen, there's sort of a very long list of concerns the DOT has around um, street furniture, around access, around uh, traffic, and so on. So. Um, what we're doing now is taking all the research, and we've done a really substantial amount of engineering and policy research so far, and shopping that around and really double-checking and triple-checking that with all of the city's agencies so that we can go back, go back to City Hall and say, look, we've done all of our homework. Um, let's, let's actually move, move ahead with this from a political standpoint. Uh, I think we have a very um, open administration, and I think the opportunity for us is really how we tie this to the very large investment the city is making to the Seward Park urban rural area. So what we are providing is 60,000 square feet of new public space that uh, that plan, which I mentioned one and a half million square feet of redevelopment, um, they only have about 10, 15,000 square feet of public space in that entire uh, plan. So uh, we're actually providing something that will serve as a, as a tremendous amenity for not only people who live here who have expressly mentioned their support in, in myriad ways, uh, but also for all these new residents, all these new businesses. Um, and it, it, it basically takes back a space that, that nobody has wanted since 1948. So 
uh, contrary to a lot of other projects, I think, where there's uh, been a deep, deep, deep level of opposition to uh, something that is constituted as, as public land, this has been a forgotten site that no one even knew existed until we started talking loudly about it and bringing it up to the community board. We sort of educated the MTA, and some, some people did at the MTA about its existence, and many people in the community about it, its existence because people had forgotten about it. Um, so we're hopeful that this is uh, an instance of found value and found space that the city will will see as something that um, will fit into their, their core priorities. Um, and then there's a whole other dimension to this, which I won't get into, which is uh, the governor and um, how the governor interacts with the MTA. So that's another, another PhD thesis for another time. But uh, maybe that's a, a small slice of what the challenges are and sort of where we are uh, right now. So um, I think this is part two of that same question, which is can you talk a little bit about funding? I know you, there was originally a Kickstarter campaign uh, a while ago, but what are your, where are your funds coming from now and what do you foresee and where do you foresee them coming from and how much do you think it's going to take to operate something like this over time? Great. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we did actually have a Kickstarter campaign in, in early 2012. Um, and uh, yeah, you guys are like behind the, the vending machine over there. Um, so uh, in, in 2012, we raised $150,000 on Kickstarter, which we were very proud of at the time. We sort of raised records, and a lot of people thought that we like built the low line with that amount of money, but we, <laughs> that's not how much it costs to build the low line. Um, we used that money to, to build the technology demo that, um, that James referenced before. Um, our funding so far has really been uh, to help finance our advocacy and research stage of where we are right now. Um, and that money has really primarily come from, from pr primarily private sources, some small foundation support, some corporate support, um, very small um, uh, uh, grants from our, our city council member as well. Um, uh, I would say, you know, so, so our, our overall anticipated uh, capital construction budget that our engineering team has laid out for us is on the order of about $60 million. Um, and six zero, six zero, yeah. Um, which, by 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 some accounts, I believe is this is a fun statistic is equivalent to roughly one or two days of the MTA's operations. Um, so thinking about it in that context is both a big and a small number. And our our plan for how we actually raise that revenue is again going to be a mix of we're set up as a five hundred one c three, so we are we are able to to uh, solicit tax deductible contributions. Um, from private individuals, um, corporate sponsors, foundations, and hopefully some government support at the right point in time um, from city, state, and federal sources. Uh, and then when we open, you know, this is a space. It's not the biggest space, but we're hoping it will we'll have a very, very vibrant um, amount of programming, a very high degree and caliber of administration and security and, um, and maintenance. So a roughly $2 million annual budget, um, you know, maybe give or take a little bit uh, on how we sort of maintain the space as a as a not for profit organization that's running a running a public amenity. Come less better from the JM Kaplan Fund as well. Well, I'm I'm not really a plant, but <laughs> I have a question based on the research. To, uh, one, were there any unanticipated discoveries of what when you first started the project? And then two, with the discovery of all this information, how is it informing your messaging and the other aspect, which is really what kind of generated this information is for the community outreach part in terms of educating the community about the immigrant history. And um, I won't get on my own platform about why, this, why the history part of this is so important. Um, in, in terms of unexpected discoveries, I think, well, two things, one, that the the city and these private car streetcar traincar trolley car operators tried several times to build something on the street and because there's been no real comprehensive history written about what this was before it was really hard to figure out what it actually was at each point in time i remember i found these drawings in the new york public library and there were these amazing sectional cuts and plans for this terminal but it was for the elevated terminal that they or the elevated line that they wanted to build above the ground not even the stub one that was actually realized in um, 1904. So it was, it was very confusing to try to sort out what, what it was and what it was supposed to become. And then another thing I found was because everybody was concerned with capitalizing on these uh, ideas of circulation and bringing people in and out of Brooklyn and Manhattan and around and around, somebody had suggested the idea of a people mover, which was basically a conveyor belt that just went on the bridge and people would walk up to it and get on it and ride and get off and then get on. And it, 
it, yeah, like an airport, I mean, it really never stopped. Um, so for better or worse, they didn't actually end up realizing that plan either. I uh, think that it, in our um, talking about this space and um, the history, I mean, we, we didn't know anything about it at all until Dan um, came to talk to us. And um, for me, it was, uh, as I said before, really quite interesting to go down in the space. People like to find weird spaces. You guys found a weird space and people are really interested in it and they like to know what it was and why it is and they like to see the little pieces of the historic stuff that's left over. So um, while we're, it's almost like a, an, an underground it's an archaeology site, and you have the rails still in place that um, uh, curve in the loop. You can understand how it relates to the bridge, and the construction of the Williamsburg Bridge was uh, to help alleviate population con uh, congestion. That transportation infrastructure created its own congestion, and the, uh, the terminal underground was meant to alleviate the congestion that was created by the bridge. So your plans um, to uh, create a new kind of space is meant to help alleviate some of the congestion that's going to uh, occur with all of the new development. So there's a, there's a, a, a resonance and a continuation of using space in different ways and um, to uh, link the space to the history of transportation in the neighborhood. I, I think you actually answered uh, part of um, Ken's question, but in, in a way more eloquent way than I ever would have said. Um, so thank you. But yeah, I mean, I think that the value of this research for um, our community advocacy um, is, uh, you know, really can't be understated. I think a lot of times when we talk about this project, people will say, oh, so it's this hole underground. Why would we ever want to go underground? What is this? Like, I hate the underground. It's, it's gross. And this actually begins to tell a, a deeper narrative, that this is part of a, a, a historical story uh, and is therefore worth preserving and worth investing in and worth, and worth saving. Um, and one of the fun things for us, and this is actually a, a dream uh, history project that we would like to actually maybe even potentially do, do next, or actually at, at Morris Vogel's suggestion early on, um, was to do a oral history uh, survey of any of the Lower East Siders or anyone in the city or even maybe they're in Boca now or wherever they are um, who actually are old enough to remember using, the, using the, this, this transportation infrastructure um, and being able to help inform an even deeper, maybe more personal understanding of what the, uh, the space meant. Because I think uh, in the face of all of this new construction and in what, sort of what the city faces right now with gentrification and rising costs and uh, divides between haves and have-nots, I think uh, people, what really resonates with people is uh, this sense that uh, we can preserve small areas of the city and, and think about them as public spaces. Um, and uh, and that you know, if, if large, classy, unfamiliar condos are sort of going up immediately above the site, that we can do one small little act of of preservation and saving a little bit of what um, uh, actually ties us back to the 20th century and to our great great grandparents. So it's I think a really important step for us is to sort of do this research and um, yeah, it's been it's been really helpful and very fun I think to 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 make this more colorful for people to understand. Yeah and. Um I love how Zach resurrected the spirit of James Delancey. Um, and throughout the talk, I was thinking a lot about not, not Delancey, but I was actually thinking about Harris and Jenny Levine, um, whose names you don't know. There's no street named after them. But they lived at 97 Orchard, and we tell their story every day. A tailor and his wife, who ran a shop, raised five children, had four workers in a 325-square-foot shop um, for 15 years at 97 Orchard before they finally had the funds and the city allowed them through the building of the Williamsburg Bridge to move to the promised land, which was not the Lower East Side, but was Brooklyn. So for them, the Williamsburg Bridge was a way to kind of get out of here. And all I could think about throughout this talk is what would they say and what would their children, they had no place for their children to play 
to know that underneath Delancey Street was going to be a park fueled by solar light underground. I don't know. I can't even understand it. And if I can't understand it, I don't think Harris and Jenny can. But I sure know that it's, it's very exciting. And I want to thank um, Higgins Quaysbarth and Elise and Rachel and Dan and James and Zach and all of you for coming and allowing us to create the space here to explore this very old and also very new idea. So I welcome you, I thank you, and I also welcome you to come back to the Tenement Museum, to become part of the Tenement Museum family by becoming a member, which helps support our programs, which helps ensure school children get to learn about the past already, and you can get your name on the donor wall, and not, with, not just with membership, but through other things, and um, also programs that we do that bring in immigrants to learn English. In, um, English speakers of, uh, of other language or second languages come here for free programs. So when you become a member, it supports these free programs at night, but it also helps support the programs we do for school children and for new immigrants to the city as well. Um, so thank um, all of our, our presenters tonight, thank the Low Line, and thank all of you for, for coming tonight.